So as you can see, I'm talking about extrapulmonary complications post-lung transplant, which are many, which I'm sure you all are aware after taking care of our patients on F2 in the ICU. So I'm going to try to give an overview of um, kind of systems-based, what to kind of expect in some post-transplant patients, um, and then try to focus in on some more common problems and ones that just we encounter more often and are kind of more hot topics or, you know, more problematic. Then I'm just going to briefly touch on some kind of drug-drug interactions and complications of our immunosuppressive drugs. Just to kind of get you guys a taste of what I, this lecture is going to be about, I'm going to start with a little case. So this is of a 62-year-old female. She's post-bilateral lung transplant for ILD and PH. Her post-op course was complicated by prolonged high chest tube output requiring pleurodesis, AFib in the post immediate post-op period, gastroparesis, and uh, two episodes of acute rejection in the first year. She now presents to the clinic five years post-transplant, presents our clinic uh, with this cake. Um, this was actually when I was down in Texas. She brought this in for us as her five-year visit um, as kind of a little celebration. She reports an excellent quality of life, um, exercise capacity, and has no oxygen requirements. However, post-operatively, um, since transplant, she's developed hypertension requiring multiple agents, um, chronic kidney disease, diabetes requiring insulin, and uh, squamous cell carcinoma, and she follows very closely with dermatology. So it truly is, you know, trading one problem for another problem like we often counsel our patients on. So just to kind of give a little overview using some ISHLT data, which you'll see from their database throughout my talk, um, looking at some different uh, areas of morbidity in one in year, one year and five year um, survival patients. So renal dysfunction, as you can see, within five years is over half of patients, which I think it's even actually higher depending on how you define renal dysfunction. But you can see... Um, even people requiring dialysis is three and a half, so at five years, so that's pretty significant. And then diabetes we see in about 35% of patients at five years. So like I said, I'm gonna to try to go system-based um, and then kind of pull out the more common um, complications and ones that you know are more problematic and focus on those. So just like any patient, um, lung transplant patients can have any of the you know, medical problems that we just see in our general populations. They just tend to be kind of augmented um, because of the medications we use. So hypertension, just about everyone, it, feel, it seemed like post-transplant is um, requiring antihypertensives. At one year, it's about 50%, and it's over 80% at five years. There are also, you know, age group, you have to think about that, so it's just going to be more common in that age group as they age. Um, arrhythmias, which I will focus a little bit more in on, um, especially in the post-operative period. Um, and then just like any other aging population, coronary artery disease. And then BT, which I'm not going to really focus on because that's kind of technically intrathoracic. That's not what the talk's about. So hypertension, um, etiology is thought to be at least in large part due to our calcium urine inhibitors, which is tacrolimus and uh, cyclosporin. It's not completely clear what the mechanism is. But it's thought that the changes in vascular tone, um, particularly within the kidney, um, and stimulation of endothelium and impaired um, nitric oxide synthesis cause increased vasoconstriction and thus hypertension. Obviously, if they have previous disease, that's going to be a risk factor um, post-transplant and steroids. Um, management in general is pretty similar to how we manage um, hypertension in any, any patient. However, we try to avoid calcium channel blockers, especially diltiazem, as they can increase tacro and cyclosporin levels. So atrial arrhythmias, which happens a lot, I feel like this um, reported incidence of 25 to 35% is lower than I feel like what we actually see. I feel like it's about half of our patients. Um, most commonly, atrial fibrillation is what we encounter. Risk factors um, kind of make sense. Older age, male sex, um, left atrial enlargement, prior AFib, obviously, um, patients whose diagnosis is IPF, who have valvular disease, CAD, and who are require pump during um, their transplant, put them at higher risk. Um, often, or not, I don't know, often, but one thing that can make an atrial flutter uh, circuit more common is the area of anastomosis between the donor left atrial cuff and the or slash pulmonary vein and the recipient. So in that area, it can kind of initiate a reentrant circuit and make a flutter more common postoperatively. Um, it is associated with prolonged hospital stays and increased mortality, so we do care about it, obviously. Um, however, it does usually respond to antiarrhythmics 
and these can usually be stopped in two to three months post-op with low risk of recurrence. So just to get a little overview of how common it is, um, there is this study that was done um, in a center, I forget where the center actually, oh, it was Houston Methodist, and they published this in 2015. They looked at um, about 300 of their patients over, as you can see, a four-year period, and within the first 30 days, 25% developed AFib, and you can see that rate in that post-operative period is the, you know, the highest incidence with AFib and A-flutter. Um, so next I'm going to move on to renal dysfunction. So I'm going to focus more on uh, chronic kidney disease, but obviously acute kidney injury, which often is the precursor to, to chronic kidney disease, is common as, long, as well as electrolyte abnormalities. So renal failure, um, I found varying reports, as you saw in the earlier um, slide from the registry data. It was a little bit lower than this, but um, greater than 90% of patients have some degree of decline um, in their renal function and this is taking all comers post-transplant. But those that actually developed, you know, chronic kidney disease or classified as chronic kidney disease is about 50% at five years, like mentioned prior. And then um, I already mentioned this too, but uh, dialysis requiring about 2% at one year and 35 at five years. So not low. Um, most commonly, it's, it's thought to be due to the nephrotoxicity of our calcineurin inhibitors. And thought to be tacrolimus a little bit less uh, nephrotoxic than cyclosporine. Also, perioperative insults obviously can increase the risk of not only acute kidney injury, but then long-term chronic kidney disease. Um, management, if able, you know, lower, lowering the doses of um, your immunosuppression, your calcium urine inhibitors, and then considering alter alternative immunosuppression agents like the mTOR inhibitors. Um, and actually, there was a talk when we just went to ISHLT about just up front starting on people on a uh, four-drug regimen with an mTOR inhibitor so that you can reduce the dose of your calcium urine inhibitor. And their outcomes, um, at least so far, looked somewhat promising to try to lower the incidence of uh, renal injury. So this is some more data from the registry showing freedom from severe renal dysfunction. They define that as a creatinine greater than two and a half. And if you trace it out over, you know, the 17 years they have, if you get all the way out that far, it's, you know, less than 50% of people, you know, have a creatinine less than 2.5. So pretty common. Um, moving on to GI complications, which is a talk in itself. Um, I feel like there's a lot of GI complications in our patient population. Um, you know, obviously, acid reflux, paired motility is a big one, um, and this often is, you know, dysmotility that we see, esophageal dysmotility, and especially scleroderma patients, gastroparesis postoperatively, and then more specific to the CF patients are things like DIOS um, that you have to watch out for. And I'm not going to really touch on um, infectious stuff because I'm not really focusing on infections, but you know, C. diff colitis and CMV colitis and any sort of um, infectious complications are going to be more common because our patients are so immunosuppressed. And then in just in general, a lot of people, even if they don't have you know, impaired motility or true acid reflux, they have a lot of GI symptoms, at least initially often, with um, many of our immunosuppressive drugs. So focusing a little bit more on impaired GI motility, just in general, we start out with patients that have very high rates of um, GI issues just from their, or not from their end-stage lung disease, but they're just very common in patients with end-stage lung disease. And estimated to be 60 to 80 percent people have acid reflux in end-stage lung disease, and up to 50 percent have esophageal dysmotility. Um, greater than 30 percent have abnormal pH probe, and greater than 40 have delayed gastric emptying, which now as we've kind of realized, you know, the high incidence in our end-stage lung people, we pretty much end up screening everyone with pH probe manometry these days prior to transplant because they can be completely asymptomatic and um, have issues. And then this often just increases post-transplant, so it's important to know um, prior for many reasons. Um, and then I'm going to touch on dysphagia. Actually, I added a few more slides about that because I think it's a kind of a hot topic. Um, it's very common post-transplant. Um, it often does resolve, but has to be dealt with, you know, in the immediate post-transplant uh, period. And in general, a lot of these um, issues post-operatively are thought to be due to injury to the vagus nerve, uh, recurrent laryngeal and superior laryngeal nerves at the time of surgery. Um, and why we care is 
one thing is, like I said, a lot of these can be asymptomatic and they're associated, we know, with um, rejection. So if we know they're happening, we have to, you know, deal with them so we can try to give our patients better survival rates. Um, in general, I'm not going to touch a lot on management because they all have different management strategies, but one thing that is done commonly is if for acid reflux surgical correction, so doing a fundification is a common practice, either pre-transplant if they can tolerate or in the post-transplant period if they have significant GERD. Um, so GI dysmotility in transplant cans, like I said, is exceedingly common. And I just pulled up this graph. This is some data from um, Duke's program. It's actually brand new data, and it doesn't even have a paper associated with it. I just was able to find this chart. It was actually like on Twitter. Um, I just wanted to point out that the amount of people are actually asymptomatic. If you see the dysmotility, half the people who have dysmotility are actually asymptomatic from it. So that's why it's important to identify it and not just go based on, you know, test almost everyone for these GI issues because based on symptoms we're going to miss a lot. So now focusing um, on dysphagia post-transplant, this is um, some data out of Duke again from 2007 where um, they looked at, they, they, they wanted to start a new kind of algorithm of what we do with these people with dysphagia post-transplant, and I'll show you that in a minute. Um, but they looked at, they did bedside swallows on people, or bedside, just a clinical evaluation by the nurse. And if it was positive, then they went on further and did formal swallow studies. Um, and they either did them with um, a video swallow or a fiber optic swallow. So this shows the whole group that had positive bedside evaluations. And then you can see um, if their formal swallow was positive or negative or whatnot. So 70% of people um, who had a positive or, well, showed dysphagia by the nurse's bedside exam had a positive swallow study. Um, and then of the, that percentage, 70 per, 77 percent were silent aspiration. So we didn't, you know, we clinically didn't even know what was happening. So that's why it's really important that we um, are very vigilant about this. Um, and then here, this table is also from Duke in 2007. It's the same um, group of patients. And the group one of patients is just the group of patients that had the positive bedside test. And the group two is those that did not have a positive bedside test. Um, and you can see the, that it's highly associated with preoperative GERD, about 50% versus 25%. And then there is a, a pretty significant reduction in hospital length of stay in those people who had um, swallowing issues post-op. Quick question. Can you yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's the, I didn't see anything about treatment. They didn't really didn't really specify it, but just if they carried that diagnosis preoperatively. So in looking at their postoperative complications in these two groups, um, I wanted to kind of point out vocal cord paresis, which obviously makes sense, um, is a large portion of them. And then the high rates of acute rejection uh, compared to, um, or not high rates, but high, much higher than the, the other group that didn't have a positive swell. They were significant. They also found uh, associated higher rate of effusions and pyemas and then VTE, which I can't really explain, but just in general, it's, they were kind of just classifying this group with this dysphagia and looking at all outcomes, and there was an association. So what to exactly do with that, I'm not sure, but in general, they have uh, higher complication rates. Maybe that was associated with the higher length of stay? Potentially. I mean, that makes sense because there was quite a bit higher length of stay. And then this was their suggested algorithm of how they dealt with their post-operative patients. So um, once they had their bedside swell, if it was positive, they go on for a video or fiber optic swell. And then if it was negative, obviously they just do the appropriate diet and be on with their life. If, if it was positive, and keep these people on PO, I mean, things we already do. Aspiration uh, precautions, very aggressive pulmonary toilet, which is important post-transplant for obvious reasons. And then getting speech and potentially ENT involved early to kind of help um, these people recover, um, have speech work with them, and then, you know, do serial exams until it resolves and get them on a good diet. Kate, I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, O-H-N-S. Oh, I think it's, um, it, it's basically ENT, but I'm thinking of oral, head, neck, and something, surgery or something, yeah, yeah. 
then 10 years down the road, um, Duke came out with some more information on this, which I think is, or actually this is UPMC, sorry, um, which is really interesting. I think this is a little bit more relevant to what we should be doing now. So once again, they found a very high incidence of aspiration and about 62% of those were silent. So once again, if we're not testing for it, we're not going to find it. So that really goes against that we can just have a nursing bedside exam because they might be having silent aspiration that we're not seeing. Um, so they actually tested everyone with a formal swallow once they were able to do a swallow exam because they, they found a very low sensitivity by just the bedside clinical swell. Um, and then their algorithm, as you can see here, I'm not going to go through all of it, um, but based on, you know, if they're having some dysphonia or if they're having clinical aspiration, they would kind of go down this algorithm and decide, do we need to get ENT involved um, because they're having this persistent aphonia and aspiration. Um, and then they kind of determine if, well, if they can travel off the floor or not travel off the floor, they would either get a modified barium or they'd get their uh, fiber fiber optic swallow study. Um, so pretty much every patient got, got the study and um, then they would go by the, similar to the previous algorithm of keeping them MPO to get a safe diet. What is the sensitivity for that bedside swallow based on I, I think it was like 40% or something. I don't have it with me, I didn't write that down, but it was around 40%. The specificity wasn't great either. I think it was like in the 60s. Um, so in general, it's like I almost feel like, why do we even do them in our post-transplant patients, if we have a concern? Um, so then moving on to hematologic abnormalities, as you know, they get cytopenias, um, leukopenia being one of the more um, common cytopenias. And they're, you know, due to bone marrow suppression from our immunosuppression agents, um, most commonly azathioprine, mycophenolate, and then our prophylactic anti-infectives, such as uh, uh, valcite, acyclovir, and Bactrim can obviously also cause this as well. But some things to keep in mind instead of just always blaming it on um, the medications, the medications, which can sometimes get you into trouble. I mean, these people who we already said have a huge uh, higher incidence of chronic kidney disease, well, you can just have anemia from that. Um, and then leukopenia, you have to, you know, really look at and not always just blame on um, drugs, especially if it's new and doesn't really make sense, is you have to look out for infection, especially CMV, because it's a um, very common way that it can present. So moving on to endocrine, um, I'm going to focus really more on diabetes because um, it's, you know, very common in our post patients. Obviously, obesity and hyperlipidemia are common as well, but they're pretty much treated like anyone else. So diabetes, up to 40% of people at five years, um, most likely from steroid, chronic steroid use, and then our calcium urine inhibitors, and more commonly tacrolimus versus cyclosporin. Management is a, so typically they require insulin-based therapy, and I can tell you that's what we do here, because um, we don't really actually have data on, or a lot of data on oral um, antihyperglycemic medications in the lung transplant population. There is data out there in the kidney population, and so they're kind of classified as all solid organ transplants, new onset diabetes post-organ transplant, and there are some recommendations to potentially, you know, use oral drugs, but we just don't have that data in lung patients. So we just, at least as our center, we don't really use the oral um, agents, but I think that down the line, if there's some more, you know, research into that, more data on that, that's a, a potential. Um, and then um, here's some data from a center in 2014 where they looked at, I think the one on the left, they looked at about 150 of their patients, and the one on the right, they looked at almost uh, 400 patients. The one on the left, it's from the same center, but just a different kind of time frame and number of patients. They just looked at diabetes or not diabetes, so they didn't kind of specify if they had diabetes prior to transplant or when they developed diabetes, but overall there was um, found to be you know, lower survival in patients with diabetes. Um, and I think we can all kind of understand maybe why that would be, because diabetes in general, um, you know, comes with a lot of comorbidities. This is any solid organ or lung? This is just lung. So everything I'm presenting is just lung. Um, and then if you see on the right there, they kind of broke it down into either no diabetes, which is the green line. Um, the blue lines, they had diabetes pre and post, which doesn't look a whole lot different than the new onset diabetes. And then the other two on the left, they're either pre-death diabetes or early mortality. So the pre-death just means they were diagnosed with diabetes two weeks before they um, died. And then the early mortality was they were someone who was diabetic, but they died within the first 90 days of transplant. Um, 
um, not really focus on any of this, but just to be kind of aware, you know, these people are going to get osteopenia, osteoporosis, because they're on chronic steroid therapy. Um, we do see people not that infrequently, too, with avascular necrosis, even requiring, you know, uh, hip replacement and such. And then myopathy is a, you know, common problem, too, especially in the post-operative period um, because of the high-dose steroids. So moving on to neurologic complications. So in general, taking all neurologic complications are exceedingly common. Over 90% of patients have some sort of neurologic complication post-transplant. Tremor is probably one of the most, I mean, if you put headache into it, it's kind of hard to have anyone who doesn't have a headache, I suppose. But um, tremor is an exceedingly common um, complication in at least the earlier post-transplant because of the higher doses of um, uh, calcium urine inhibitors. Uh, confusion, seizure, press, which I'll focus on a little bit, and then stroke. Um, like I said, it's often due to calcium urine inhibitor toxicity, and we, um, you can switch just between the two agents to see if you get some resolution of some of these neurologic complications, um, depending on which one you started with, you flip-flop between the calcium urine inhibitors, um, but they both can cause neurotoxicity. One thing I wanted to point out a little bit was post-op stroke. So I think that, I mean, we don't see it a ton, thankfully, um, but I think it's important to realize two very um, specific stroke um, etiologies or mechanisms that are unique to our patient population, which would be air embolus, you know, immediately. And then thrombus can actually form at the left atrial anastomotic, anastomotic site that embolizes, and this can be days to weeks later. So obviously just, you know, as a general population, we have the normal etiology of stroke, um, but these are two kind of unique um, considerations in our patient population that have to be looked into if someone develops a stroke either immediately postoperatively or within the first days to weeks postoperatively. So PRESS is something I think we're all familiar with that we do see from time to time. It stands for posterior reversible encephalopathy syndrome. And what you see on your um, imaging, your MRI is edema without infarct in the posterior regions. And you can see a little picture there where you have the uh, bilateral cortical and subcortical T2 hyperintensity. Um, <clears throat> and it presents, I think we all probably know, you know, altered mental status, headache, even as severe seizures and coma. Uh, hypertension is only, or can be absent in about 20 to 40 percent of patients, but it's highly associated. Everyone thinks about hypertension in press patients, but it's actually often absent in, our pa in patients. Uh, the path to physiology is not completely clear on how press develops, but the thought is there's impaired cerebral autoregulation in response to hypertension. Well, those are the people who are actually hypertensive with then increased cerebral blood flow, endothelial dysfunction, cerebral hypoperfusion that then leads to edema. Um, but it's not really clearly control understood. So if the patient's hypertensive, obviously control their blood pressure and that should help. Um, in the case that they're not, um, you're going to hold your calcium urine inhibitor and then potentially reduce the dose down the line once they resolve or even switch between the calcium urine inhibitors or consider switching class. Those are kind of the recommendations. So malignancy is obviously a really large topic that could be you know, multiple talks in itself too, but I was going to focus on uh, PTLD and skin cancers because I think those are ones that are stand out a little bit more in our post-transplant patients. Skin cancer just being exceedingly common and then uh, PTLD obviously being specific for a post-transplant population. Uh, in general malignancy, you have about a two to three-fold increase in risk after any cell and organ transplant compared to the general population. So general surveillance is exceedingly important post-transplant. Obviously, that's why one of the reasons we you know, look people over with a fine-tooth comb and make sure we don't have any malignancy hiding on us because post-transplant, it's just going to blossom and be a, a major issue. Um, and then, in general, of all the, all the comers of malignancy, non-melanoma skin cancers are by far the most common. So looking at um, more registry data at 1, 5, and 10 years of malignancies, by 10 years, 30% of our patients have a malignancy, which, I mean, that's pretty impressive. But then you look at the type of malignancy and the time course, skin cancers are always high, um, but they remain high and kind of trend up and then trend it back down. But lymphoma is much more common within the first year um, post-transplant, or the PTLD.
that's just a, a little different uh, way to look at it, just freedom from malignancy, and it, it breaks it down into all malignancy, skin malignancies, and then um, PTLD, and you can see that, you know, out 15 years, less than 50% per percent of people are malignancy free. I didn't even focus on it because this is technically extra thoracic, so that's why I didn't. I mean, I looked at some stuff on it, um, so I didn't really focus on it for this talk. But it's In general, like what Hui was saying, in the COPD population who get like a unilateral and are older, that's the most common to develop it, but yeah. just another kind of slide different way to look at it and this um, breaks it down into the first 30 days and 30 days to a year one to three three to five five to ten and greater than ten um, and the rates of um, lymphoma or PTLD and then non um, PTLD malignancies um, and how prevalent they are or the deaths are this is not the, the instance this is deaths from it so we said about 30 percent um, at 10 years had a malignancy and then we can say at 10 years, there's about, what, 15, 16% um, have died from the malignancy. And it's just another way to look at the same kind of table um, showing, oh, this is, sorry, this is all cor different main causes of death. And malignancy is obviously one of them. And chronic rejection or BOS, the way they've you know, classified it here, um, infection and then graft failure. And you can see the malignancy you know, goes way up after the first year, kind of plateaus around the five to ten year mark, um, but pretty significant. So, kind of focusing on PTLD itself, about five percent of lung transplants or transplant patients altogether develop PTLD. It's the second most common malignancy after the non-melanoma uh, skin cancers. Um, intrathoracic is much more common in cases presenting within that first year. And then extrathoracic is typically more common to have a later presentation. It, you have an increased risk if you're EBV negative and you get a recipient, recipient who acquires a primary EBV infection post-transplant. So that's something we look at in our pre-transplant patients and part of our workup. Um, you're also just at an increased risk, obviously, with the higher immunosuppression. Um, if you're someone has a lot of acute rejection and you're feel like you're constantly giving them steroid bursts or you're going up on their immunosuppression, they're going to be at higher risk um, for developing any malignancy. And in general, and I'm not going to go into depth about treatment because it depends very much at what type of PTLD they have and it gets kind of, you know, complex. Um, but in general, reduction of immunosuppression, rituximab is used, and then chemo and radiation are used. Typically, chemotherapy is reserved for refractory disease or and patients who have EBV negative and CD20 negative tumors. And then with rituximab treatment, about 50 to 80 percent response rate, so pretty reasonable. So I thought this was kind of important to point out. And how does EBV have to do with PTLD? So on the left here, you can see the pathogenesis. So basically, 
the thought is to what happens is there's B cell proliferation um, induced by an EBV infection, and then in the light of immunosuppression, um, there's a reduction in T cell um, immune surveillance. So then basically there's, it's, you can see the X out in the little diagram there, and it just kind of goes wild and has that uh, B cell proliferation. Um, classification, so there's four main types. It's, to, it's categorized into early lesions, polymorphic, monomorphic, and then your kind of classic Hodgkin um, lymphoma-like PTLDs. And you can see um, PTLD, obviously, in EBV negative patients. It is about 30% of the patients. It's not really entirely clear what the pathogenesis is. It's thought that there's potentially just no longer detectable EBV virus or there's some other undetectable virus that's kind of causing the same issue. Um, so they believe there probably still is an underlying virus causing the, the, this, you know, kind of unbridled just B cell proliferation. Um, but they're technically classified as EBV negative in 30%. So now moving on to non-melanoma skin cancers, our most common uh, malignancy post-transplant and squamous cell carcinoma being the most common of them, which I thought this is a really like kind of eye-opening. You have 65 times greater risk of developing squamous cell carcinoma post-transplant than if you, you know, didn't have a transplant. So, and it becomes more aggressive with, and it's obviously in general, it's going to be more aggressive than someone who hasn't had a transplant if they do develop skin cancer and has a much higher recurrence rate. So that's why it's very, very important that all of our patients see a dermatologist at least yearly for full body exams, but then if and when they find something, they need really, really close follow-up with dermatology because um, a skin cancer going unchecked can become a, a problem down the road, obviously. So this represents, if you can see this little table here that I just pulled out, the 10-year survivals, 23%, so almost a quarter of patients at 10 years are going to have um, skin cancer. So sometimes it's a matter of like if, not, or just when, not if. So treatment, if they're on azathioprine, it's recommended to potentially switch to a mycophenolate, um, reduce immunosuppression in general. So you can add an mTOR inhibitor, then that lets you bring down your calcium urine dose, or you can just replace the calcium urine with an mTOR inhibitor. Um, and that's thought to, you know, not only help with just reducing the immunosuppression in general. Um, and term inhibitors are thought to have some tumor suppression effects. They block tumor angiogenesis, so some antineoplastic properties. And then once again, I'm not going to really touch on the specific surgery, um, but there's topical cryosurgery, Mohs surgery. Lots of patients have had Mohs surgeries, and then if it's very advanced, systemic therapy. So like I said, that's just why it's very important. They're hooked up with dermatology and see them when they're supposed to follow up with them at least yearly. So I'm just going to kind of go briefly, I'm not going to, this is not an immunosuppression drug uh, lecture, but I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the more common drug reactions and complications of our, our medications, just things to look out for when you see these patients on the floor um, and kind of question when you're starting a new medication, is this safe, is this not safe? So I'm not going to, you know, this is a lot, very busy slide, but just represents our most commonly used immunosuppressant drugs in uh, lung transplant population. And we all know that they need very regular monitoring of um, their blood work because of the renal toxicity and because of the cytopenias that can happen. Um, but there's obviously lots and lots of side effects um, and needs lots of monitoring, which isn't going to be something as, as much that you'll have to deal with. But I'm going to go into some of the more common complications from these drugs. So just in general, I thought this was a kind of a good summary, just so there are things that you should know or look out for when you're admitting these patients or, you know, see these patients on these medications. And we get a lot of exposure to transplant patients, obviously, you know, working here at Henry Ford. But, um, you know, I, I think, you know, I didn't learn this, this kind of stuff in residency. So um, for calcium urine inhibitors, the altered mental status, like I said, the uh, neurotoxicity, and it has huge range, but, you know, causing press and seizures and tremors. Uh, nephrotoxicity, obviously, is very common. Hyperkalemia um, with azathioprine, more the leukopenias, and then liver um, injuries, so transaminitis, that can be one of our limiting factors with azathioprine. And the mycophenolate GI intolerance is exceedingly common. It's, it's not uncommon in the early post-transplant period, and some ways we deal with that is changing the formulation uh, from cell sept to uh, uh, myfortic, 
or decreasing the dose, or even, which we don't really do as much, but you can um, keep the same dose and just do more frequent dosing. It's a BID medication, but you could theoretically do it three or four times a day and potentially still get the same higher dose that you want, and it can be more tolerable. And then obviously leukopenias as well. And then with Bactrim, leukopenias, nephrotoxicity, hyperkalemia, and, and you know pretty much all our patients are on that three times a week for PCP prophylaxis. And then Valcite can also cause leukopenia, which can be somewhat challenging because you get a patient who presents with neutropenia, and is it the Valcite or do they have a CMV infection? And obviously the treatment's completely different, either you're on it or not on it. And then transaminitis. I thought this was kind of important too. Um, this is obviously not at all an exhaustive list, but some kind of more commonly seen drug interactions. Um, and I'm focusing here on this chart just on how they can affect our calcium urine inhibitor levels. So as you probably have all seen, when we've started someone on azole antifungal, we take down their tacro dose because we anticipate that the levels will go up. Um, in addition, calcium channel blockers, especially diltiazem, like I mentioned earlier, macrolides, I mean, PPIs, allopurinone, soft water urease can all increase calcium urine inhibitor levels. Um, so if you are introducing some of these drugs, if they're not strictly contraindicated, you need to have follow-up levels to make sure that you, you know, didn't jump their level up to 25 or something. Um, and then medications that can decrease the calcium urine levels are many of the, the seizure or antileptic medications, rifampin, uh, rifambutin, and then many HIV medications can do this. St. John's wort, bocentin, which hopefully our patients aren't going to get bocentin post-transplant because that would be a problem. Um, and then this uh, phosphate binder. So I'm going to end just with a little question that kind of ties in a bunch of the things we talked about. Um, but the reason I, or well, I'll tell you why I put this question in the end because I might give it away if I say now. So this is of a 48-year-old female who's post-lung transplant uh, for PH one year prior. Her course was complicated by acute kidney injury requiring dialysis in the perioperative period, but is now off. Her medications include tacrolimus, azathioprine, prednisone, Bactrim, Prilosec, Norvas, Glantis, and Novolog. Her labs, her creatinine baseline is about 1 to 1.3. Her labs, when you see her in clinic, it's within her baseline creatinine at 1.1. Her most recent hemoglobin A1C is 6.3, so reasonably controlled on her um, diabetic regimen. White counts normal and then she has some protein urea. She actually uh, meets with her nephrologist who she had been fine with after getting off dialysis and her blood pressure in clinic is 158 over 95 which correlates with her logs that she's been doing at home which has been running in the, the 140s to 160s. Therefore lisinopril is added um, by nephrology. Then she follows up later with you and at her if you visit, her blood pressure is controlled. She doesn't have any complaints. Her white count um, is 1.5. had been previously stable, 6 to 10 on her current regimen. And otherwise, the rest of her labs are normal, including her recent uh, CMV quant that was done in this set of labs. So what do you think is the most likely cause of this patient's new severe leukopenia? Do you think it's a CMV infection, a bacterial pneumonia, um, azathioprine, she's probably just taking the wrong dose, taking too high a dose, and that's why now her white count's suppressed. Or do you think that it's azathioprine plus the lisinopril combo? Anyone want to guess? Yeah, kind of led you to it, but um, I put this question here because I didn't know that. Um, I had never seen that clinically, I never read about it, but apparently the combo together can have a increased risk of very severe uh, leukopenia and it's thought that ACE inhibitors are thought to slow the elimination of the azathioprine and this allopurinol can also do this. I knew this about allopurinol but I did not know it about ACE inhibitors. Um, but you also always have to be vigilant because you can have leukopenia in the face of infection especially CMV but that's why I put in there that her CMV quant was negative and everything else was essentially normal with how she was feeling in her lab work. Um, so just kind of summing, you know, summing up the whole talk is these patients, as you guys have all seen in the hospital, very commonly develop medical comorbidities, similar to our general population. It's just kind of on steroids, you know. Um, 
and it's largely due to the immunosuppressive medications that they require post-transplant. And also, as you know, our recipient age and survival continues to kind of increase, we're going to be seeing these more and more common. In general, for a lot of these comorbidities and management, similar to the general population. Um, but one point that you know I already kind of made is, you know, they are at huge increased risk of malignancy. So in addition to their dermatologic evaluations and close follow-up if they do develop skin cancer, um, they have to continue maintain all their uh, regular cancer surveillance because obviously uh, a cancer in them could be catastrophic. Um, and then as far as drug interactions and drug side effects, just when in doubt, you know, discuss it with transplant pharmacists because there's so many interactions out there that you have to look them up all the time and talk to them because, you know, any kind of new medication, if there's any question that it might be an issue, um, you know, you should be know beforehand before starting it. But I tried to kind of pull in some of the ones that we see more commonly um, and, and how we deal with that. That's actually quicker than I thought, but... Questions? I don't know how it is in the outside of lung transplant. I mean, it's due to tacrolimus, but.